federated learning and our toy setting is we have we have a bunch, a collection of small data sets. So a data set could be a person. And these data sets, they are way too small to fit a, a complicated model. So do I have a color here also? Color red. So this is way too small to fit a complicated model. So what we need to do is we need to, we need to find our friends, so to say, those which have similar distributions as, uh, as our data set and pool them together. Okay, so far so good. So find the right chunks of data to pull them together and then train your big model. So what is challenging here is that these data sets are, are small. So this was, this was our starting point. Uh, so how can, we, how can we know which data points to pull? And one first idea was to fit a simple model. So to fit a very simple model to each data set and then use the model parameters. Uh, so here we get a model parameter, here we get a model parameter to pool them uh, or to cluster them. So this is a first idea, a simple, uh, this is then called clustered federated learning or clustered multitask learning. Uh, but the problem is still that it seems in our toy setting, this doesn't work. I mean, our toy setting is we generate these data sets using a linear regression model with some noise. And what I'm interested or we're interested in is, is the, the extremely high dimensional regime. So the number of features D over number of data points, in this case, three is let's say thousand or hundred. So basically you have only one single data point to train a high dimensional model. Uh, so in this high dimensional regime, any estimator uh, that we tried out so far for the model parameters was too noisy. The clustering didn't work. So what, what I was now thinking to frame this as a, 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 no, a bandit problem, a bandit problem. So what, what is a bandit? So I look at each data set as a, an arm of, of a slot machine. So uh, and what, what does it mean to pull an arm? And pull an arm means I use this data set. I try this data set out. So how do we try data sets out? We compute, uh, we could compute a gradient of a current guess for the best parameter vector here. So this is our current guess for the best parameter vector here at node i. And we use the other data set to compute the gradient. And this gradient will be noisy because we only have a small subset of data. And then we try to, to use this gradient and do a gradient step. So we, we update our current parameter by a, a, a multiple of this gradient. So this, this means to, to pull an arm in this setting. And we of course have many different options. So all the other data sets are possible arms. So we have a lot of arms. So which arm do we use? What would be a natural idea? Well, we, we need some reward measure in, in a casino or in Las Vegas. After you pull an arm, you get a reward measure in either you don't win anything or you hit the jackpot. You get a lot of. So what, what is the jackpot here? Homayun. Uh, sorry, I don't want to answer this question, but I think it's like like multi-arm bandit problem. But uh, yeah. before going to that, I have uh, I have a question here. So this is not federated learning in its original form. I th is it something like some, because I can see that you added several, actually many, many assumptions, like the small sample size, a small and large P samples uh, data in each client, which is not in yeah. the original federated learning and being IID distributed, which is not in a federated learning. So is it a different kind of federated learning problem or? So it, it's federated because I assume, so these data points, they are, in itself, they are IID in these local data sets, but they uh -huh, are not okay, IID so... when you pull them together. So they are okay. they are two clusters. So it's it's a clustered federated learning. And ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Now I get the point. Okay, so basically yeah. you're explaining clustered federated learning and how you solve the problem. Yes, exactly. We, we ah, okay. are looking at the specific way to clustered federated learning because clustered federated learning is one way to to solve this. So the ultimate goal, I mean. The ultimate goal that I have now in mind is how do I find an optimal model for this local data set? This local data yeah. set could be a, a person, me, and this is some health data, and I want to learn a best healthcare app for me. 
but I have too little data. So I need to look around uh, from mm -hmm. other persons' data sets, but I need to find I need to find which data sets are the right ones. And why it's it's federated learning because there are some constraints how I, how I exchange information. For example, I cannot share raw data. I can, for example, only share gradients. So that's why this gradient picture comes in nicely in, in federated learning because changing gradients uh, means some privacy protection. I don't need to share raw data. Uh, when I when I want to try out this data set, instead of really downloading the data set here and trying it out, mm. I only download, I only get back the gradient or a, an yeah. estimate of the gradient. So there is but no the, server in this case. There's right? no server. It's fully fully oh, okay. decentralized. Fully decentralized. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so the reward is could be, for example, how much does the gradient step uh, reduce my loss here, my local loss, training loss. And then what I do, I pick the data set with the highest reward. And uh, I repeat, I repeat, repeat, repeat. So in each round, I randomly select a, a bunch of other local data sets. And the problem is to find out if the gradient that I get on this local data set is an unbiased or, or almost unbiased gradient estimate for my local loss function or not. So this model is similar to, to a setting where you, you have some, some validation set, you have a small validation set, and you want to, to train a model with the model parameter. And what you get is you get, you see over course of time, over iterations, so it's an iterative algorithm, you get provided with uh, possible gradients. So you get a first, uh, a first gradient, then you get a second gradient, and these gradients are either an unbiased estimate of, of the gradient for, for your loss function that you really want to minimize, or they are gradient for another loss function. So some of them are good and some of them are bad. And the challenge now is to find out uh, what are the bad gradients? So which gradients you should not use? And to do this, you, you must have some information. If you would not have a small validation set, there's no way to tell apart which gradients are the right ones because you don't know how your own loss function looks like at all. You don't know your, your model landscape, so to say. So how can you know if this gradient now is good for you or not? But what you have here is, is a small hint in the form of a small local data set that you can use as, as a validation set to compute rewards. So you can try out this gradient, uh, check the reward. If the reward is high, you use it or you exploit it in the sense of doing the gradient step. Then you get a new uh, gradient, approximate gradient in, and you find this doesn't reduce my loss function, so I don't do it. I skip it or I reject it. So my first question would be if somebody of you ever saw a similar model for stochastic gradient descent. This sounds like it, it must have been already started, but I don't know the name of this model. Like stochastic gradient descent with rejection sampling or something. Does any does this ring a bell in any one of you? Have you seen a similar model or methods? Uh, it actually does ring a bell for me, but I don't remember. I remember I've I've seen some uh, some optimization algorithm like this in one yeah. of the new Rips papers a while ago. I need to yeah. recheck, but uh, I'm pretty much sure that I've seen something like this. Yeah, please do not hold back the link if you if you remember. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I, I very good, very good. That. This must have been started somewhere, and I just uh, don't know where to search yet in, in under which uh, under which hut. Uh, okay, but the, why I want to tell it to you, so I don't have any analysis yet uh, because I didn't have time yet to work this out, but uh, uh, Amir uh, has done some experiments and it, it looks extremely good. So it looks that this works for D to M uh, on the ratio of five. I mean, it's not 100 yet, so there are still a lot of things to improve, but it works. It finds the correct other local data sets when you have uh, a model whose dimension is five times larger than your own uh, data set. So without any regularization, without any tricks, you would overfit for sure. But this simple method of pulling the arms and then looking which one gives the highest reward works, at least for me, surprisingly well. Amir, do you have, do you have anything to add here? Hi, everyone. No, actually, you covered all well. Exactly. Yes. Yes. 
And uh, yeah, it, it's really an interesting setting. We, there is some recent work on, on, on this setting from, of course, from Michael Jordan and the Berkeley people. But uh, as I understood from AMIA, their method is not really uh, easy to implement. So we are not really seeing this uh, method to be optimal as they claim it in their paper. It's called provably provable federated learning or something. I can share it to you on our Slack. Okay, and as I understood, their, their idea is what I mentioned before, try to get some noisy estimate of, of your parameters, model parameters, and then cluster these model parameters, these noisy model parameters, do some k-means clustering. But this seems to be very difficult in practice to, to tune at least. So for this simple linear regression setting with more features than data points, it didn't work that easily. But this simple uh, gradient descent step with, uh, with uh, using rewards and selecting those gradients which give the highest reward, Works surprisingly well. So I'm still I'm still a bit uh, worried that we have some we have some bug in, in our simulations because it looks so good. So we need to test it more a bit. Okay, any questions to this uh, setting? Uh, I have a question. I, I mean, just based on the problem definition, I haven't uh, like did any research on clustered federated learning. Uh, but I'm thinking like so. The best uh, neighbor or the best client for each of these uh, clients would be the one that has a data with more or less, or let's say very similar data distribution, like the minimal uh, KL divergence. Yeah. So is there a way, let's say, if you if you formulate this, like each of these clients formulate the problem as a Bayesian, in a Bayesian way? Yeah. And provide some some information about its posterior distribution to yeah. the others, uh, other clients. And then the other client send its gradient if its distribution is very close to the posterior yeah. of the, the desired uh, cluster. Does that make yeah. sense? Yes, absolutely. And there is work. Uh, so this uh, can be modeled as a, a hierarchical base model. So you have some yeah. latent variable that, that tells the local data set you are now in group A or you're in group B. And within group A, we have IID data. So and I think this has been done. Uh, uh, so I want to oh, avoid okay. any, any prior assumptions. And again, the challenge here is, so what one could say, okay, let's estimate uh, the probability distribution. Let's make some histogram of, of this local data set and of that local data set. And then use those uh, distances or divergences between these probability distributions as a, as a distance measure mm -hmm. for k-means clustering. But again, the challenge here is that we, we are really interested in the extremely hard case where there are like 100 times more parameters than data points. So estimating reliably estimating the KL divergence is highly non-trivial. But this might be, of course, made possible when you have some prior assumptions. Absolutely. But of we, course, we yeah. didn't study this in detail yet, uh, Bayesian methods. Mm. I think that fits actually quite well there because usually Bayesian models work quite well with a small sample size. Yes, data size. yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. If, uh, by the way, if if you come across also a relevant paper, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm methods, searching for that. Yeah, yeah please, yeah. please share with us. In this. Yes, very good. Any other comments or questions? So, uh, uh, to, maybe to to give more motivation, just beside of its beautiful mathematical structure, this uh, model or problem might be relevant for healthcare for. For applications, for example, you want to learn some predictor for diseases, and these are very rare diseases. So one, one local data set here is not a person, but a disease. And each dot here is a person that had that disease. So you have uh, typically for a rare disease only few samples, uh, but you still want to learn a complicated model that reads in all, for example, the genetic information about a person, so high dimensional models and predict the risk of, of this disease. So here again, you have for, for a disease, very few samples, but you might have other diseases which have similar structure, which depend on similar genotypes or phenotypes or whatever biological properties. And the, the challenge then is to find out which other diseases have similar characteristics and you could use also as a training set. 
Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Actually, I found this uh, this library. I, and maybe it's not that uh, relevant, but uh, it's a method to uh, to calculate the similarity. It's mainly designed for um, multimedia uh, documents. Okay. But it maybe somehow can give some uh, inspiration to us. Yes. Yeah, please share on our Slack. I send uh, this link. Could you oh, yeah. open it? Okay, here. Yeah. Meta research. I used this library for, uh, I think, semantic search. Mm -hmm. But that was for just a text um, embedded with some transformer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe images. I'm not sure. Yeah. OK. Let's see. Yeah. That would be interesting to study. I will forward this to Yasmin, who's doing some experiments at the moment. And this works for specific type of data. Uh, it's mentioned for multimedia documents. Multimedia documents. Yeah, yeah I, I think, again, in, in these methods, that they use some implicit prior assumptions. Yeah, I uh, think so like how natural images or text looks like. Uh, this prior assumption might be leveraged from pre-trained models, maybe. Uh, and in this sense, so th thanks for the pointer, that's very relevant. Uh, just to point out, in this sense, we, 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 we make our lives harder because here we do not assume any prior assumption. So these this data points in our simple toy model, they are IID from a Gaussian distribution. And uh, you know, they're completely uncorrelated. So we, we, we do not assume any intrinsic lower dimensional structure. For example, such a lower dimensional structure would be given by the, the manifold of all cat images. Might be a very low dimensional manifold, but we, we are not inter uh, at the moment, I'm not interested in such uh, uh, prior assumptions. Uh, but really, I want to study here the, the absolute fundamental limits. But in practice, of course, you must use any prior information. So for the disease disease application, I, I was thinking, how could we use this uh, multimedia similarity search for diseases? Well, you can characterize a disease by all kind of X-ray images of patients that have that disease. So you have then a multimedia a representation of the of the data set. Mm -hmm. 